Hello and welcome everyone, I'm James Murphy, and today we're talking about asynchronous iteration in Python, otherwise known as how to use the async for loop. First, I'll teach you the syntax of an async for loop and how to use one through one of its main applications, writing an asynchronous web application. In order to see it work, we're also going to have to write a client for that web app, and then I'll finish up by showing you the nitty gritty details of how an asynchronous iterator actually works in Python. I'll show you two different ways of writing an asynchronous iterator, both using an asynchronous generator, as well as the low level protocol for it. So let's get started. An async for loop in Python looks and feels a lot like a regular for loop. If I had for x and y do some stuff, then that means I'm going to loop over the collection y and get each element x out of it, and then do stuff with that x in the loop. Same deal, if I have async for x and y, this means that I'm going to asynchronously loop over the elements of y. The main difference in the purpose, though, is the expectation that in order to get the next x out of the collection y, I might need to wait. Why would I need to wait? Well, the most obvious applications are waiting on IO operations. So waiting on bytes that you're getting from the network or waiting on bytes that you're reading from disk. If I'm waiting on receiving a file over the network, I can't really control how long it takes the next chunk to get to me. The file might be really big and require many packets, or the client might just be slow and take a while to send them. So while I could, in theory, wait for each packet and process them one at a time, that would be really wasteful because if I'm just waiting for them, if this for loop involved a portion where I just slept until a packet was available, then I wouldn't be able to handle any other requests while that waiting was happening. Well, that's kind of the whole purpose of async. I can wait on as many things as I want to at the same time. So an async for loop is just like a for loop, except it's got the idea of waiting on the next element built into the syntax. That means that in theory, I could process as many other requests as I want while I'm waiting on packets for this one. Next up, let's write a simple asynchronous web app that takes advantage of this. Asynchronous web app, you say? Surely we're going to be using FastAPI. Don't get me wrong, FastAPI is a great library. Let me know if you want me to make a FastAPI tutorial. But for this video, I'd like to use something else. Did you know that FastAPI is kind of just a wrapper around another much simpler library? If I go to definition on this FastAPI class, you see that it actually inherits from this starlet object. And let's take a look at some of the imports in FastAPI. A lot of these imports are also coming from this starlet library. A lot of the main types of objects from FastAPI are actually starlet objects or wrappers around starlet objects. But sadly, while FastAPI has nearly 70,000 stars on GitHub, poor little starlet only has 9.3k. But I think starlet deserves a lot more attention for itself, so I'm going to use starlet. And it also helps you learn FastAPI too, since pretty much everything in FastAPI is a wrapper around a starlet thing. Both Starlet and FastAPI allow you to write ASGI applications. That's ASGI, A-S-G-I, which stands for Asynchronous Server Gateway Interface, not to be confused with ASCII, the character encoding. The main benefit of Starlet is how dang simple it is. All you need to do is create a list of routes to help Starlet map requests for certain paths to certain async functions. The example we're going to be building is just going to echo back the SHA-256 hash of whatever file the user uploads. So whenever we get a post request to the root of our application, then it's just going to call this function compute SHA-256 and pass in this request object. Now what we're not going to do is store an arbitrarily large uploaded file in memory and then compute the SHA-256 hash. Attempting to store arbitrarily large files provided by a user is a great way to crash your production servers. But the great thing about many hashing algorithms is that you don't need the whole file in memory in order to get the hash. You can operate on the bytes chunk by chunk as they come in and then throw them out. In that sense, SHA-256 is what's called an online algorithm. So that's what we'll do. We'll write this online SHA-256 function, which is going to asynchronously compute the hash as the bytes come in. We'll understand a little bit more about what this stream object actually is later, but for now, just know that it's something that we can use an async for loop on. Given a stream of bytes, how do we compute the sum? 
let's create the object that knows how to do the actual complex hashing part. Then we'll asynchronously loop over all the chunks in the stream. As each chunk comes in, we feed it into the hasher so it can update its current value for the hash. The stream will end when the client tells us there are no more bytes to process, at which point we return the current value of the hash. We just await on that value and then return it as a plain text response. Believe it or not, this tiny amount of code is actually a fully functioning ASCII application that will compute the SHA-256 hash of an arbitrarily large file. In order to see our application actually work, we're going to have to run it, which we can do using Ubicorn. Ubicorn is an ASCII web server, so it's like an Apache web server or an Nginx web server, but it's specifically for running these kind of ASCII applications. It also happens to be a project under the same encode organization that writes Starlet. Let's go ahead and run our application. Looks like it started up just fine, and it's running on port 5000 on localhost, of course. But to actually see it work, we of course need a client to send us a file to hash. So as is almost always the case when we write a server, we're going to need to write at least a test client in order to make sure that our server works. We certainly don't have to, but let's make an async client as well, so we'll be using the HTTPX library. And would you look at that? It's another library written under this encode organization. We'll start by creating an asynchronous client. We'll use the client to post some data to the URL that the server's listening on. Don't forget to await the response because this is an asynchronous client. Once the response is ready, we'll read the response body as bytes. Typically, hashes are printed in hex notation, so we'll use the hex function that's a built-in bytes function in order to convert from a bytes object to a hex string representation. For testing purposes, let's just put in some fake file data, which we supply using another async def function. Now, because this function is marked async and it also has yields in it, this is actually an async generator. This is just like a normal generator, except you're allowed to await things inside of it. We're going to take advantage of that by sending hello world, but with some fake lag in between. Hello world is small enough that it would normally be sent in a single chunk, but because we put this sleep in there, we can actually force it to be sent in two separate chunks. Yielding an empty bytes object is the way that we tell our client that we have no more data left to send. So let's scroll down here and go ahead and run the client. When we run the client, we do get a response from the server that looks a lot like a SHA-256 sum. And from the server's point of view, we can see that in the process of computing that hash, it received three separate chunks, hello world and empty bytes. And in case you're wondering, we do in fact get the correct hash that we would be expecting if we just manually passed in hello world into the SHA-256 function. Because you know, you can hash any sequence of bytes. Like, instead of the user's password, you might hash their username instead. This is what unit tests are for. Getting back to asynchronous for loops, how does that stream object work? How do we create something that can be used with an asynchronous for loop? Well, I already snuck it in there. This fake file data that we were using in the asynchronous client code is actually an asynchronous generator, which is an asynchronous iterator. Just like a normal generator is an extremely easy way to write an iterator that you can use with a normal for loop, an async generator is an extremely easy way to write an asynchronous iterator that can be used with an asynchronous for loop. And just like with normal generators, async generators are typically much simpler and what you should prefer to use over trying to implement the asynchronous iterator protocol. Let's see how to write our own async iterator to implement rate limiting. Suppose we have some API. In this case, we're just doing some fake sleeping and then multiplying by two, but imagine it's a real API. We have a bunch of tasks that we want to send to the API that need to be done in order. So we just loop over them and await the results. But when we run this, although we do wait for the result from the previous call until sending the next one, we're still spamming calls as fast as we possibly can. We sent out all 10 of our requests in about one second, but let's just say for the purposes of this example that the API has a rate limit that they ask us to send no more than five requests per second. To do that, we'll write this async generator called await rate limited. We'll use an async for loop, pass in our awaitables, and tell it what the rate is, how many items per second it's allowed to process. 
So let's implement it. First, the reciprocal of the rate is the maximum amount of time that we need to wait. We'll do a normal for loop, looping through the awaitables, awaiting and yielding each one in turn. Let's also compute how much time we spent waiting. But if we've already spent some time waiting for the server to respond, then we don't need to add that as additional time onto our sleep duration. We can actually subtract it off so that the total amount of time between requests stays approximately around that one over rate amount. This max with zero here is for the case that the server takes a long time to respond and we've already waited our entire required sleep duration so that we don't need to wait at all. As soon as we get our response, we can go ahead immediately with the next API call. <clears throat> and of course, don't forget to use asyncio.sleep instead of time.sleep. And there we go, let's test it out. This time around, we see that it took about two seconds to complete, and that's because we were waiting, even though we didn't have to, we were being you know, nice users of the API and not spamming them too much, staying within their five requests per second limit. Instead of using an async generator, the other way to do it is utilizing the actual async iterator protocol. Firstly though, let's go over the normal iterator protocol. When you do a normal for loop for x and y, Python calls iter y, which calls y's iter method. Any object that has this dunder iter method is called an iterable, and its sole purpose is to return an iterator. Python then repeatedly calls next on the iterator, which calls the iterator's dunder next method. It continues calling next to get elements from the iterator until the iterator raises a stop iteration exception. The for loop handles all these calls and catching the stop iteration for you. So the iterable is a thing you can iterate over, like a list. And the iterator models the process of visiting each element. So for a list, you could imagine an iterator keeps track of the index of the current element. In terms of actually defining this in terms of classes, there's two protocols, one for the iterable and one for the iterator. The iterable just needs dunder iter that returns an iterator. And the iterator needs dunder next that returns the next element or raises stop iteration. But Python made a somewhat controversial additional choice. They said, we don't want people to have to type for x in iter y, that would be annoying. We want it to automatically call iter. But on the other hand, if someone does manually call it equals iter y, we also want to allow people to iterate using that iterator using a for loop. So in what will cause confusion for Python students for the rest of time, they required that all iterators are also iterables that return self. Meaning an iterator must also have this dunder iter that just returns self. Now we don't have to write for x and iter y, we just write for x and y. And if we do happen to have an iterator, we can also write for x and it. Great, so I snuck a whole lesson on normal iterators into this video, now how about async ones? Luckily, it's very nearly the same. To do async for x and y, first Python calls a iter on y to get an asynchronous iterator. Then it repeatedly calls and awaits a next on the iterator. This continues until eventually the iterator raises a stop async iteration exception. Once again, the async for loop hides all these calls and catches the stop async iteration for you. To implement this with classes, we need two new protocols. The async iterable that just has a dunder a iter that just returns an async iterator. And the async iterator that has an async function dunder a next to get the next element or raise a stop async iteration. Once again, Python wanted to make all async iterators async iterables, so an async iterator must also have a dunder a iter that just returns self. Note this is just a normal function, not an async function. The only asynchronous part is waiting on the next element, so dunder a next is the only async function here. And that's all you need to know about the low level protocol. Let's see how to apply it to the rate limiting example. Here's how you could write the exact same very simplistic rate limiting that we had with the async generator using the actual async iterator protocol. It's a class and on construction, we take the awaitables and the rate. We get an iterator to the awaitables, which is going to be corresponding to this normal for loop inside the async generator. We compute the max sleep duration and we use this variable to help us to compute the time difference between two subsequent calls to our a next function. A iter always just returns self. The wait if needed function encapsulates the logic of waiting however long we need to wait in order to comply with our rate limit. 
then getting the next element just means waiting if we need to, updating our last iteration time, trying to get the next awaitable. Again, this corresponds to a normal for loop that's going to throw a normal stop iteration if there are no more awaitables. We have to convert that to a stop async iteration, otherwise we're going to get like a runtime error. And then if not, we have an awaitable to await on, so we await it and return it. Obviously, this is way more complicated than the simple async generator that we used here, and it accomplishes exactly the same goal. And we can use it in the exact same way. I could literally replace this with the capital await rate limited, and it would work just the same. So if async generators work, then why would you ever want to do this? The only reasons you might prefer to do this class way sometimes rather than the generator way is the same reasons that you would normally prefer a class over a function. You would prefer the class approach if you had a lot of state that you need to keep track of or invariants that you need to keep track of. If you have a lot of operations that modify those state and need to maintain those invariants, then you could factor those out into functions on the class or just using methods on a class in general to help you organize the process of doing the iteration if it happens to be extremely complex. Now, if your iteration is really that complex, maybe you should be rethinking the way that you're doing things in the first place. But if it really is just that complex, then maybe a class might be the way. Anyway, thanks for watching. Check out my website, mcoding.io, where I offer consulting services. As always, thank you to my patrons and donors. Don't forget to slap that like button an odd number of times, and I'll see you in the next one.